let us pray. Faithful and loving God, your grace makes our faith possible. May we live and go about our lives as people who place our trust in you. May we love and care for others as people who turn to you for help. Where there is doubt or distrust, renew our faith. Where there is fear or insecurity, grant us courage. Where there is fatigue and weariness, give us amazing strength. Where there is confusion of purpose, give us wisdom. Where there is sorrow and loss, bring us peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and just, will cleanse us and redeem us that we may begin our lives anew. Together, let us approach God with our prayer of confession. Loving God, we yearn to be as merciful with others as you are with us. We long to set aside past grudges and love others for who they are now. We are tired of sitting in judgment and failing to see others as your beloved children. Fill us with your grace that we might have enough faith to work in your ways and to seek the healing of your world. By the grace of God, in the grace of Christ, and through the grace of the Holy Spirit, by reaching out in faith, we touch the presence of God. May we feel this touch and grace as we pass the peace of Christ today, using the sign language. We raise our fingers upward to make a big circular motion. And then we do the symbol for Christ crucified, and then this is to share with all. So together, may the peace of Christ be with you. Our gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, and 18 to 26. It's on page 790. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. When he got up and followed, and he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when they heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, he suddenly, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> the Psalter is responsive. Psalm 33, verses 1-12, as printed in your book. 
Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord God, and may the skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. But the word of the Lord is silent, and all God's word is The Lord grants loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord and the Lord of the and all their hosts by the breath of God's mouth. God gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. God put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth hear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world be snailed and bowed by God. For the Lord spoke, and it came to be. The Lord commanded and it is the first of the The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. God frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. God is all our God's are all to all generations. Happy is the nation whose Lord, whose God is the Lord.
For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and the guarantee to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written. I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God who, in whom he believed, who gives the life, who gives life to the dead and calls, calls into existence the things that do not exist. Open against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words that was reckoned to him were written not only for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. This too is the word of the Lord. Listen also for God's word as it comes to us from the Hebrew scriptures from Genesis 12. And if you're reading along, you'll notice that um, Abraham is referred to here as Abram, and Sarah is referred to as Sarai. Um, the names change suddenly as the story unfolded. And, um, we're, but it's the same people, the same matriarch and patriarch of our faith. Um, also, when I sent the sermon title to Pat for printing earlier this week, um, I thought I was going to preach something different than what I ended up with. So this sermon title is, um, is Go From Your Country. So let us listen for God's word. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak, to the oak of Morah. And at the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Magdalene. Friends, this also is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. How many people who were in worship today have resided in Ulster County, had an Ulster County address for their entire lives? Got a couple of folks, and as there were, uh, we have some over in Highland. Uh, how many people have lived only in the state of New York? 
for their entire lives. Okay, greater representation. Do we have anyone who's lived, who's uh, resided, not traveled, but resided in another country? Okay. Yes, we do. I didn't think BJ was going to be here today. <laughs> so you're not alone, BJ. But most of us have experienced a chapter in our lives uh, similar to that of Abraham and Sarah. We have moved. We relocated. We collected our possessions and moved to another place. So when each of you, or some of you, moved to a different place, what was it that prompted your move? Marriage. Marriage. Job. Job. School. Fun. Fun? Did someone say fun? <laughs> I won't call names, we're on video, but you know who that is. Father was in the military. A military family. Okay. Father in the military. Um, political law people. Persecution. Hunger. Also absent from this crowd, no one said, God told me to pack my bags and move to another place. <laughs> Tell your daughter she ranks right up there with God. <laughs> so it was Abraham and Sarah who heard God speak to them and said, go from this country. That's what happened to them. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. It was God, not his daughter, it was God who told Abram when he was 75 years old to go from the land of Ur to the land of Canaan. And Abram's birthplace was in Ur, what we um, now refer to as this, it's now the southern part of Iraq. And Abram listened to God, and he traveled through the region, areas we now call Iraq, Syria, Israel, and Egypt. He later went to Egypt when there was famine. And this was an extraordinary journey that Abram launched when he was 75. Most of us Envision or our experience at 75 retirement. We're sort of settling down, not launching a new chapter in our lives. Abram was just getting started in terms of our biblical story. Abram was told to go to his father from his father's country to a new country, and he did. And this was God's promise, a promise that will later learn. God made good to Abram and Sarah. God said, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abram trusted God, and his faith in the Lord was founded. Abram was blessed. He had children. A new people came from his son Isaac. And from Isaac we trace the lineage of the Jewish religion. And in Palestine, a nation known at various times as Canaan, Israel, and Judah. And Ishmael actually was Abram's firstborn uh, to, uh, through Hagar, his handmaid. And through Israel, we trace the roots of Islam. And by the grace of God, Abraham was able to establish a new home. Fortunately, most of us, when we picked up, packed up, and left, we've been able to do the same. We left one home and established another. But realize, not everyone is so blessed. Not all people have a roof over their heads upon which they may depend, 
economic scarcity yields uncertainty with regard to housing. Not all have potable water at the tap, if available at all. Not all people have food when they are hungry. Think about the times we've sat down before a meal and the table's just covered with dishes of food. And before we dig in, we say, oh, this is great. I'm starving. And what is a throwaway line for us is reality. For so much of the world, almost a billion people are starving. A third of the global population is food insecure. Rising sea levels will force hundreds of millions of people to move in this century. Jake is going to see a repopulation of the planet unprecedented in our time. Remember, it was after Hurricane Katrina in 2005 that when that storm hit New Orleans and that part of Louisiana, a million people were immediately displaced and relocated. A million people overnight here in the United States. People move. Like Abraham and Sarah, people pack up their possessions, if they have any, and if there is time, and they move. Astonishing it is to meet people in the United States with nothing more than a suitcase or only their clothes on their backs. And I think probably most of this congregation has met such a person or people in their lifetime. But imagine what it is to arrive in a new country with only your life. Breathing. Breathing is the only certainty. Without food and water and shelter, the breath of life is imperiled. Almost all of us has, have been spared the hardship of existence. And by that, I don't mean the hardship of life. When we experience challenges we hope never to have faced. We've had heartache. We've had physical pain, psychological cruelty, despair, discouragement, depression, setbacks. And that's significant. But few of us have wondered if we would even live by having our basic human needs met. <clears throat> but I cannot say all of us have been spared the terror of, uns of uncertainty. Because I know folks in each of our congregations who have had a time or times in their lives when they just have not known if their lives ever would be secure. The vulnerability of displacement intensifies with the growth of population and the depletion of resources. <coughs> There was a lushness on this continent that was present after the Reformation took place in Europe. 500 years ago, Protestants and Catholics split, and this continent inhabited still had a vastness that we can't even imagine. How quickly, how quickly humankind is consuming the life-giving resources of the earth. We now find ourselves at the crossroads of our humanity. How shall we respond to the need for survival 
not prosperity, but survival. Consider the entertainment options that we've had in this century that have numbed us, really, to the situation in which we find ourselves. We can turn on the TV and watch, who wants to be a millionaire? Or we can turn the channel and we can watch survival. Hollywood has contrived these two extremes but they're real time in our communities. We may look at the distance to our border, to the border of our nation, and we may think that it is there that humanity gathers. It is there that those who are desperate to set foot on American dirt find themselves. But the refugees are in our towns and villages here now. Abraham and Sarah have arrived, as did the baby <coughs> Jesus, the child Jesus with Mary and Joseph in Egypt. Jesus was a refugee. Christians seldom ascribe that description with the Christ child, refugee. We are willing to attach Jesus to his birth mother, Mary to his adoptive father, Joseph, and to his procreative maker, the Holy Spirit. We're willing to describe the baby as an infant holy, infant lowly. We cradle Jesus and bestow upon him numerous titles. Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, Savior. Yet one crucial aspect of Christ childhood narrative rarely is noted. Jesus was a refugee. Mary and Joseph took flight to Egypt to escape tyranny. They ran for their lives with their precious child. We often omit this story in the Christmas season. We have wonderful attendance, the season of Advent, Christmas Eve, and then it drops off until the new year. And if we mention that story of the flight to Egypt, it's then, and there aren't many of us here to hear it. 